Hi Ninja Nerds, in this video we're going to talk about cardiac output. If you like this video, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And don't forget to check out ninjanerd.org. That's our website where you can find whiteboard lecture style notes and diagrams for these lectures. All right, let's get started. So cardiac output, what is it? Cardiac output is defined as the amount of blood that's ejected from the heart in one minute. So cardiac meaning the heart and output meaning what is going to be pushed out, right? So we have the amount of blood that's ejected from the heart, and we have this equation right here, which is CO equals HR times SV. And right here we have the um, representation of what all those mean. So cardiac output, like we said, is the amount of blood that's ejected from the heart in one minute. And that can be defined as milliliter per minute. So it's the amount of blood in one minute. And then we have heart rate. And what's heart rate? When you go in and check somebody's heart rate, you go and assess the patient, you're going to be checking how many beats, right, per minute. So you're going to go in and you're going to say they have 60 beats per minute. And the last is stroke volume. And what is stroke volume? Well, it has the word volume in it, right? So we know that that's going to be milliliter. And stroke meaning, think of it as another word for beat, or the amount of blood that's going to be pushed out. So we know it's milliliter per, per beat. Every time it, the heart beats, it pushes out some volume of blood. So right here, we have written not only what cardiac output is, but it, it also correlates with our heart rate and our stroke volume. And the reason this is so important is because if we were to write out this equation like this, where we put heart rate is beats over minute times our stroke volume, which is our milliliter per beat, we would know that beats are canceling out, right? And we are left with our cardiac output, which is our milliliter per minute, okay? So we start with this because I want you to understand that cardiac output is dependent upon other things going on in our body. Specifically for this video, we're gonna talk about heart rate and stroke volume. And heart rate and stroke volume can even be broken down even further. So let's back it up again. We know that the cardiac output is the amount of blood that's ejected from our heart in one minute, right? So the first thing we're going to talk about is our heart rate, because if we alter our heart rate, then we can alter our cardiac output. So we know that with this right here, our equation, it's a multiplication, right? So if we were to increase our heart rate, we would then increase our cardiac output. And if we were to decrease our heart rate, we could decrease our cardiac output. Okay, so let's talk about heart rate. How does heart rate work? We know what, what's going on with that. So within our heart rate, we know that this is controlled by our SA node, our, our sinoatrial node, right? And that is right here located in our heart. That is our SA node. And our SA node has another name. Do you guys know what the other name, the the other name they use for it. It's also known as the pacemaker of the heart. And it is so named because the SA node sets our 60 to 80 beats per minute, okay? So our SA node, our pacemaker, sets our heart rate typically to the sinus rhythm of 60 to 80 beats per minute, which is great. And heart rate, is determined by chronotropes. And there's two types of chronotropes. There's positive chronotropes and negative chronotropes. Positive, meaning they are going to increase the heart rate, and negative, they are going to decrease, okay? So positive chronotropes, we first have our sympathetic nervous system, right? So when you, get, when you have um, any type of heart rate, because you start having that flight or fight syndrome, like you're going on, fight or flight, what's going on? When the heart rate starts picking up, we have that positive chronotropic effect because we start getting heart rate, really, really high heart rate, especially some people get it so high that it goes into palpitations because they get stachycardic. What are other things that can be positive chronotropes? There are certain types of drugs that our body makes, and then there are certain types of drugs that we can also give. 
The first two are both, epi and norepinephrine, we can give and also make. So we can increase our heart rate just by a response or also giving that to our patient. We can also give them atropine. Atropine is a positive chronotropic. It's going to raise the heart rate. So if someone's at bradycardic, we're able to give them some atropine and then their heart rate hopefully comes up to a normal rit or rate. There's also some other positive chronotropes like hormones, specifically thyroid hormones, T3 and T4. Exercise, when you work out, your heart rate's going up, hopefully not too high. And then also your age, because think about age as positive chronotropes as well, okay? And then there's also negative chronotropes, so the ones that are going to decrease our heart rate. And those are in our parasympathetic nervous system. And there's also drugs that we can give, like digoxin or metop metoprolol, all right? So any type of our beta blockers that are going to decrease our heart rate. And there's also other hormones as well, thinking about thyroid hormone. So we know as an engineer and said, if we increase our heart rate, we are going to increase cardiac output. And if we decrease our heart rate, we are going to decrease cardiac output. So that's what we're talking about here. So if we go over to this side, we talked about heart rate. Now we're going to talk about stroke volume. Stroke volume, we know, is our volume per beat. Right? So the amount of blood that we push out every beat with our heart, okay? And if we increase stroke volume, we know this increases cardiac output. And if we decrease stroke volume, we will decrease our cardiac output. But stroke volume can be broken down into three different things. And we're gonna talk about each one individually, and I want you to just understand them at the basis of, if you remember what stroke volume is and how it's measured, it's measured by milliliter and is measured by beat, and we're gonna talk about that. So first is preload, and preload is the force that stretches the ventricle before contraction. So we're filling, right, with all this blood. We're filling up with blood, all of that volume is going in there. And right at the end, the end diastolic volume, right, right before contraction is where all of our preload is. So if we think about that in that way, there's different ways that we can increase preload and decrease preload. What is one way you can increase preload? So think about it, if we're thinking about a volume, right, and we're talking about the force that it stretches, right, before it contraction, so we're putting a lot of volume in that ventricle, it's expanding, it's stretching, and it reaches a certain volume. What is one way that we can increase preload or increase volume? We can give our patient what? fluids, right? So if you increase the fluids that our, our patient has, or you increase the volume, you are then going to increase preload. So if you increase preload, you increase stroke volume, okay? What else is going on with fluids? If you can also give them what? What is a medication that you can give them that's going to increase volume? back to the heart. You're going to give them vasopressors. If you give them vasopressors, right, you're increasing preload. You're increasing return, venous return back to the heart and therefore increasing our preload, which is increasing our stroke volume, which is increasing our cardiac output. You got it. Now, what is a way that we can decrease preload or get volume off? Well, one of those ways is if your patient is peeing a lot or diurese. So if they're peeing a lot, they're getting a, out a lot of volume. You can either do that by giving them medication or they're doing that on their own. They can also have a problem with their blood volume going down. And we know that is hemorrhage or blood loss, right? Because we're decreasing that volume, we're decreasing that fluid, okay? So understand that preload again, is that force that stretch the ventricle. So as the ventricle stretches, it's filling. We're in that end diastolic because diastole means to fill. So as it's filling, we can either increase it by giving them more fluids or having more return to the heart faster, or decrease it by either giving them some type of diuretic or having them diurese. Or unfortunately, if they're hemorrhaging or losing a lot of blood, they're going to decrease preload. So if we increase preload, 
we increase stroke volume and then therefore increasing cardiac output. But if we decrease preload, then we decrease stroke volume and potentially decrease cardiac output. Does that make sense, right? Okay, we're going to contractility. What does the word contractility mean? It means to contract, right? And that is determined by the strength. So, super easy. If the contractility, if there's an increase in the strength, right, that means there's an increase in the stroke volume, and therefore we have an increase in the cardiac output. Okay? And there's different drugs we can give, positive um, inotropes or negative inotropes, meaning to increase that strength and decrease that strength, and that's what we're talking about with contractility. The last thing is afterload. With afterload, it's defined, to, defined as the force of a ventricle must pump against to eject blood. So what we're talking about here is that as the ventricle ejects blood, it's got a force that it has to fight against. So you can think of force, right, as what? Some type of resistance. So we're going to talk about increasing afterload and decreasing afterload. Increasing afterload is vasoconstriction. And that vasoconstriction can be due to a bunch of different things. You know, we're having a plaque buildup. We're going to be giving them some medication so we can vasoconstrict them. They're having some type of issue with their valves or their valves are uh, stenosis of the valves and they're getting stiff. And that is causing some issues with afterload. So then if we would increase afterload, we would actually decrease stroke volume. And you're like, what? Yeah. If we increase afterload, we decrease stroke volume. Think about it. We are making this heart have more force, right? It's got to work harder. So if it's working harder and it's going through constriction, right? It's got an issue. It's got to push it through here. It's going to have to work harder. And if it's working hard, it's meeting resistance or constriction. It is therefore going to have less of a volume that goes out. And if it has a less of a volume that goes out, then we are what? We're going to decrease cardiac output. And the last thing here that we're going to talk about is afterload. If we decrease it, we are having vasodilation. Okay. All right. So what I want you to get from this is afterload, if we increase it, has an um, inverse effect on stroke volume. So if we increase afterload, we are creating more force that the heart needs to pump against. So because of that, it's not going to get as much volume out per beat, so therefore we're going to decrease our stroke volume and it's going to decrease our cardiac output. All right, Ninja Nerds, in this video we talked about cardiac output. I hope it made sense. I hope you like it. Make sure you check out our website, ninjanerd.org, where you can find these notes completed and this whiteboard completed. And as always, until next time.